where you you know type in something, uh, whatever was typed into that won't change, unless you can unless you go to you know Android.config changes attribute in the manifest. So for any type of configuration change you say you said you can handle there, you'll receive a call to your current activity on configure changes, and that will be in your mini activity class, right? So the activity class of whatever you're coding, right? And then over there you can just uh, you know like hard code it, right? So this is what it looks like in the manifest, right? So as I was saying before, whenever you create an activity, you need to have a corresponding activity name in the manifest. So it looks like this. And this is the type of things you could put in there, right? So if you change your configuration of your, your device, then the keyboard won't become hidden. It'll stay with it. And this is what it looks like in the main activity. So it's saying when you start a new configuration, uh, whatever you already had there, you know, the conversion pages will stay the same. Moving on to the next thing, um, starting activities and getting results. So this mostly, you know, deals with intent filters. So the start activity intent, the intent method is you should start a new activity, which the UI will be placed at the top of an activity stack. So it takes an intent, which is like basically like a, it's like an integer or like a field. It's one of those things, you know, like a boolean. Um, but uh, it takes an intent, which describes the activity being ex executed. So new intent, this register user class, right? So what this means is this refers to the, the current activity running as of now, right? So as I was saying with my rage catalog example, say you were on the quest selection, right? So this would refer to quest selection activity. Now the next one above that would be quest details. So this would be quest details dot class, right? So you could uh, call this whenever a button's clicked and the quest details will be created for you and you'll see it on your UI. Um, if you wanna get a result back from an activity, so say like uh, you have like a, Google, like a Google Maps activity, right? And you want it to get a new activity and start a new activity and get all the, get like the closest, closest pizza place, right? Uh, you could use start activity for result um, as start activity result intent int. So the int will identify the call and the result will come to you on activity result which is uh, a method you, that you could implement into your activity. And when activity exits, it can call set result int to return data back to its parent. So that was like the, my example, the location app and the pizza place. And this can be used to confirm if activities run its course properly. So, you know, if you don't get anything back, that means your app didn't, you know, the thing you called that didn't work correctly. So you didn't get your pizza place. So as an example of this, this happening, um, on to the result right here. So basically this is what, this is what happens here. It starts this activity and then it gets the data back. <clears throat> Permissions, uh, this is quite an important thing, right? So, you know, whenever you're starting, when I, when I actually just started this, you know, presentation, it asked me if I want to share my screen, uh, show my face and use my microphone. So this is, this is basically similar, like a similar thing, right? So if you're on your, uh, if you're on an app, right? Like uh, Snapchat or Instagram, right? They always ask you if they want to like, you know, go through your photos, right? So this is like some similar thing. So sometimes an activity will need to use process to allow it to access cameras or photos or locations, and sometimes even the internet. And generally things that the user would like, would like an application doing, you know, carefree, you know, they have to ask the first if they want to do it. In such cases, the permissions will, you know, need to be added to the manifest and using the user permission uh, element and a process will be, will be needed to run to add the person user for permission. And that happens in the activity, right? Examples of permissions are intent flag, flag granted URI permission, which allows the activity to access specific URIs on the internet. Um, so an example of this is like access network state internet. So this is what I actually had to do for an API. So an API basically just like gets information from the cloud and brings it back, right? But to access the internet, which my you know computer wasn't allowing it to do naturally, I had to add this permission. And it's something that this is what it looks like in the activity, right? So what happens is that there's a pop-up on your UI that says, would you like to would you like to allow said application to, you know, receive SMS or send SMS? SMS as in like messages, right? 
and you can say yes or no. But uh, whenever you say, whenever you restart your application, it'll ask you that thing again and again because you know it has to be it has to make sure. So moving on to the next thing is the XML. So what Android applications used to create layout files? Um, layout files are basically just like what your UI looks like, right? So if you're in the XML, you can see what your UI looks like before you even start it. Uh, so moving on to that, an XML. So what exactly is an XML? An XML is where you build the UI for your application. So it shows what the UI will look like before you start your application. And uh, views, which are exactly what you know the user can interact with. So views can be buttons, text views, or images. Can either be dragged or dropped or hard coded into the XML, right? So what it basically what it looks like is like there's like a there's one side where it shows the code for it, right? The hard code. The other side shows what the UI will look like before you even start your application, right? So on that side you can drag and drop, and on this side you can hard code. So what does the XML contain? So XML uh, can usually contains two things: views and view groups. So a view usually draws something that the user can see and interact with. So a button, a text view, which is just a piece of text an image, which is obviously an image. Um, whereas a view group is an invisible container that defines the layout structure for the view and other view group objects. So say you have like a linear layout, right? And it was like a, a you know, like a horizontal, it was a horizontal constraint, right? So whenever you add things like a button to that layout, right? And it's horizontal constraint, the buttons will not be like button, button, button. It'll be like button, button, button because it's horizontally constrained. So how does my activity work with the XML? In your on create, you should call the set content view, and then you will you know, input that as a r.layout.layout that underscore file underscore name. So obviously I wouldn't name my layout that, but um, that's what happens. Um, XML attributes. So what exactly are attributes? So each view and view group contains their own set of XML attributes. So, and some attributes are specific to view objects such as text size for text view widgets, uh, which is your text on the screen. While others are more general, like the attributes for constraints where the view is, you know, where the view is on the, on the screen. So example of this would be, you know, the text size or the text font. So it could be, you could make it Arial or whatever, you know, Times New Roman, which is quite popular. And, uh, we can even set the color of different text. Uh, the most important one, though, is the constraints, right? So if you just drag and drop, you know, buttons and text onto your screen, then when you create your application, you know, you won't really know where they are. So you have to constrain them, right? So that they are placed relative to other things, right? So you can constrain it to the bottom of another button or to the bottom of the entire screen. Uh, another another important thing is IDs. So all views and view groups have an integer ID associated with it, which uniquely identifies them, the view within the tree of the main view group, right? So say in your linear layout, right, you have three buns, right, and you didn't name them. Well, then when you're calling them in your activity, you, there's no way you would know which one is which, right? So in that instance, I would call. I would call one of them button one, button two, and button three. So example of this would be Android ID uh, at plus ID ID underscore my button. So the button is actually called my underscore button. And this would be in the code section of the XML. So this is important when you call the find returns by ID in the main activity. And the find returns by ID, basically what it does is that it, it says uh, you have a field at the top of like, field as in like, you have like a, you've named like an integer, right? In your main activity, or like a text view. Now the text view needs to be constrained to something in the actual layout, right? So how this is done is say, you create a text view named A, right? And then you say in your on trade, A equals five which is by ID R dot, uh, R dot something uh, dot my bun, right? So let's see what this does is A is constrained to my bun, right? So in your main activity, whenever you just link to A, that's what will happen to my underscore button. Um, XML, layout parameters slash positions. So what are layer parameters? 
So every view group implements a nested class that extends view group .layout params, which deals with property types that define the size and position for each child view. So all views contain a width and height, right? But uh, the thing is, the support with that is that sometimes if you make them too big, they might become so big that they're bigger than the screen, or they might push out other views. So if you have a button that's like, say, maybe nine pixels tall, right? You wouldn't be able to see your other buttons because it would push it out. Um, so height and width has to be defined. And you can use exact measurements like 150DP or 150 SP, or you can use wrap content, which extends it across all the content. So say you have a text view, right? And you wrote, it's the text view, right? Now, depending on how big those, you know, that phrase is on the screen, the view would be as big as that. Or it could, you know, be match pen, which extends it over the whole screen or the whole view group, right? So so that this is a text view, you would have lots of extra space if you use match parent. Next thing is what are layout positions? So each view has location expresses a pair of uh, left and top coordinates and two dimensions. So basically how this works is like when you're on the screen, right? Everything is placed relative to the top left position. Um, so the units for location dimension are in the pixel, obviously as you would expect with you know devices. So to retrieve locations of one of the me methods to retrieve locations, we need to use get left and get top, which return the x and y coordinate respectively, in relation to obviously the uh, top left position. For the height and width, you simply need to call get width and get height, uh, which is it's simple. It's it's a basically it's a basic get class, you know, basic get and set uh, on the instances of the view. So say as I was doing previously. So say I have button A, right, which is constrained to my button in the in the XML. I would do a dot get width in my on uh, in some class if I want I mean, in some method if I wanted to, and that basically would turn me the width and the height. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the three most common layouts. So the first one is the linear layout. This is a layout that's organized its ch children into single horizontal or vertical rows. So it will create a scroll bar if the window exceeds you know past length of the screen. So example of this is uh, right now. This is a vertical linear layout, right? So as I'm explaining, these are buns. So what, so what your UI looks like when you create it. So this is the top, middle, and the bottom, and it's a horizontal uh, linear layout. So it's left, middle, right. Um, next one is the relative layout, and this one enables you to specify the location of you know views relative to, relative to each other, right? So this is a text view, right? Um, this is a button, right? So this this is a button relative to where this place is would you know be forty pixels under it and zero pixels to the left of it, right? And another important thing, the next important layout is the constraint layout, right? So when you have the UI, you have your top, left, right, and bottom, right? So it enables, it enables you to specify the location of child objects to the side of the screen or the view group. So say this is, this is my my text view, right? And I'm in constraint layout. I would say that it would be constrained to the top, bottom, left, and right. And that it would be 50% from the top, 50% from the bottom, 50% to the left, 50% to the right. So that it is in the exact middle. Uh, any questions, by the way? Um, uh, anybody have any questions for asking anything? Uh, okay, no questions then. Oh, what language does Android Studio use? So thankfully it uses a pretty simple language, uh, Java, right? Which is good. And that's kind of what's expected. Um, other, you know, language, other things use like Swift, which is for, um, developing I, uh, apps for your iPhone, right? And you'd use Xcode as your ID, but obviously Android, you know, most basic uses Java. Uh, next we move on to the manifest. So this describes essential information about your app to the Android build tools. 
So the build tools are just like the Gradle, right? So this is, this is basically what happens from your .java class to the .class file being, you know, run on the uh, on the UI. Okay, so what exactly is the manifest? The android.manifest.xml, it's an XML file, but um, it's at the root of the project set source and it's necessary, necessary for every project. So the manifest describes essential information about your app to the Android build tools, aka the Gradle, the Android operating system, and Google Play. So an example of this is, as I was saying previously with permissions, right? Where you have to put them down in your manifest, this would be necessary to Google Play it, right? Because well, actually, no, no, let me, let me reset, reset that question again, actually. So say in your your app, right, one of the activities needs a certain um, certain version of Android, right? This would be important for Google Play because if somebody downloads your app, they're going to want to know that they can actually run it. It's a game. You know, it might require something more advanced to run it, and that's kind of why it's important to put things like that. Also, the Android operating system, uh, so you need permissions, right? You can't just go out and take somebody's location. You have to ask for it first. So that would also be important. And now we, oh, sorry. What is supposed to be declared in the manifest? So the app's package name, which matches the name of your project. Um, the Android build, build tools use this to determine the location of code entities when building your project, right? So obviously on your computer, you have all these files, right? It's going to want to know what your app is named, I mean, what your project is named, and it's, gonna, it's also going to want to know what each activity is named and everything inside of it. Uh, and then the components of, of each app, which includes all activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. So at this time, you only really need to know about the activities and like a basic sort of you know understanding. So each component must define basic properties, such as the name of its Kotlin or Java class, uh, as I forgot to mention, actually. Android Studio can also use Kotlin, but most of the time it's really simple just to use Java because Java uh, extends across a wide range of resources. So other declared capabilities are, you know, which device configuration it can handle and the intent builders. Also, as I said previously, versions of the apps in order to access protected parts of the system, like location, sending messages, your photos, your camera, uh, the internet, data, all sorts of stuff. And the hardware and soft features that the app requires. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, Android, I mean, Android obviously keeps updating, you know, like their apps and then their phones and stuff. It's Samsung basically, right? So if your app needs like a newer version of it to run, then that'd be important to say because if the person is downloading the app, they wanna, they're gonna wanna know if it's gonna run. So manifest uh, file features. So the manifest file root element requires an attribute for your app package name. So whatever you named your project. So uh, here it is. So say uh, my my project was named my app, right? Then it would be named my app there. So basically, the Android app tools use the package attribute for two things when building the AP APK. And the APK is what's the center of the, the Gradle. And the Gradle executes on that and creates your UI, which is what you see on the screen. So it applies the name as the namespace of, for the app generated R classes, R to Java classes. So it's used, which is just used to access your app's resources. So an example would be like com.example.myapp.r. And it also uses the name to resolve any relative class names that are declared in the manifest file. Sample could be com. Example, my app dot main activity. So as you can see, my app dot main activity. It's it's just you know useful relativity, right? So um, main my app is like the the global name for the project, right? But main activity is an activity name. What activities inside of that? Um, so if, if if it's you know wants to access what's inside of the main activity, it would do it that way. Uh, another important thing is the app components. So for each app component that you create in your app, you must declare a corresponding XML element in the manifest file. So right now, we only really need to focus on activities. 
So for each subclass of activity in the app, if you subclass any of these activities without declaring it in the manifest file, then the system cannot start it. So say uh, I had an activity that starts like a, looking for pizza places, right? Um, if I don't declare it in the manifest, then it's never going to do that. And the user will never be able to find pizza places. So the name of the subclass must be specified with the name attribute using the full package designation. So example is this here. Activity is the, 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 for everything inside the application, right? Uh, which sort, you know. And then it's an activity, so you need to you need to start and you need to close it, right? And you need to use the name attribute. And also, if the first character in the name value has appeared, the s uh, name is prefixed to the name. Okay, moving on to the next thing. Uh, the intent filters. Okay, so app activities, services, and broadcast users are activated by intents, which is what I showed you guys before with the on star activity intent this you know activity, stuff like that right so an intent is basically a message defined by an intent object that describes an action to perform like uh finding pizza places including the data p acted upon uh, which could be like you know data for a map and the category of component of comp component that should perform the action right so that would be like uh like the app, like the Android's, like for you know, obviously for Apple, you have Google Maps, right? But for something, you know, whatever the conversion is for Android, it would get to use that. So when the app issues an intent to the system, the system locates an app component that can handle the intent based on the intent filter designation in each app's manifest file. So if it would be to like find locations, right? It would search for an activity through everything that you have in your app and it would find something. So this is an example here, right? Um, it shows that this this, this action this ac this activity can send data, and it can also send like multiple data, which is like you know images and stuff like that, right? So say you wanted something to say you're in your main activity, right? And you want to send a message, you create an activity that would do that, and you would put an intent filter to tell your app that you can do that. So the system will land an instance of the matching component and it passes the intent object to that component, basically telling it, basically giving it the data and asking for, and asking, you know, telling it what it needs. So an app component can have any number of intent filters, which is defined with um, intent filter element. Uh, so say an activity wanted the location of a user or something like that. Instead of finding the location within the activity, it can open activity, which will find the location and return it to the activity or one like rest of it. So you might think this is this is quite tedious, right? But it's actually a little bit easier because if you had to, you know, you know, if you had like one activity, right, and you wanted to write, you know, things for instance like that, like finding a location, sending a message, or accessing the internet, it would take a really long time, right? So it's just simpler to create different activities to do that for you. Uh, next thing for the manifest is icons and labels. So a number of them have icon and label attributes. We're displaying a small icon or text label when a corresponding app is called. So the most basic one is like whenever you start a new activity, there's a little loading screen thing, right? So in every case, the icon and label are sent in the parent element because the default icon on label as a default icon on label, right? So usually it's just like the, you know, runs little loading button um and that's used for all activities so in the intent filters the icon labels are shown to the user whenever that component is presented right so say i'm starting a new intent to find me pizza it'll do the little loading screen and then i'll find it and then you'll we'll return back to the activity and yeah so an example of this would be right uh, sorry right here the icon icon would be this, right? So basically, they have in whenever you start whenever you start your project, right? They all they all have like default things like uh, images and the images. This is one of the images that they use whenever you're loading a new activity. Uh, moving on, permissions and device compatibility. This is what, this is what I was talking about before, with um, 
new you know versions of Android coming out, you really need to say what type of well, let's let's just talk about uh, permissions. So Android apps must request permissions to access sensitive data such as contacts and SMS. So sending messages to other people and receiving messages or other certain features like cameras and internet access for APIs. So, you know, getting, getting data from the cloud. So each person is identified by a unique label. For example, an SMS message would be, have the following line, android.name, android.permission send SMS. So if you put that in there, and then you also put, and you also ask the user in your main activity, then you can send messages. Another important thing is device compatibility. So the manifest file is also where you declare what types of software, hardware or software features your app requires, and that's what type of devices your apps is compatible with. So I know this sounds stupid, but um, say your the hardware your you know app needs is like a, a camera. Um, you could say that, or you could say that it you know, or the more sim uh, uh more advanced type of thing like, say you need a certain amount of RAM or, uh, you know, data or. or RAM or something like that, you know. Uh, it, it'll also say that. And software features like just the new features of and new, new versions of Android. Um, can't really go into detail about what that is, but it's just you know, you see something like that. So there are several manifest tags. The most common are use this feature, and this element allows you to declare hardware and software features that your app needs. So for example, if your app cannot achieve basic, you know, functionally without a compass sensor, you can declare it as required using a manifest tag. And what this says is um, when you're in Google Play, right, and somebody wants to download your app, they won't be able to because they don't have a compass sensor. But, you know, usually they would, right, because that's phones have all, all phones have that stuff now. So the second most common tag is the user's SDK tag. So since each successive Platform version off, often adds new APIs not available in the previous version. The use SDK tag will be necessary for to indicate the minimum version which your app is compatible with. So APIs really just like access data from some other, you know, data center from the cloud also. Um, so your manifest must include the use SDK tag and its min SDK version attribute, which is you know, as described, the minimum SDK version required. So elements in the use SDK element are overridden by corresponding attributes in the build.gradle file. So the build.gradle file is just basically what it's, it was written by, you know, and uh, Android. And it just says, and actually by Google, right? And it just says that this, will have, this is how we will take what you have from your Java, Java files and execute it. And, and uses the corresponding activities properties to convert it into the APK. So you should you specify the main minimum SDK version and target SDA version values there instead. And basically, the, the, the Gradle uses Groovy, which is a, a different language, but you don't really need to know about that because uh, it's not really that important. Um, so an example of this would be, this, this is what your Gradle looks like. So the minimum SDK version would be 15, and the target SDK version would be 28. Uh, next, the most important thing is the widgets. So these are the views that I was talking about earlier, and they can be embedded into other applications. So uh, most basic one is text view. So text view is a user element that displays text to the user, and these are editable version of this is the edit text. So this is what it looks like in the XML, and what it looks like in the activity, right? So this would be, as I was saying before, it sets constraints to the layout, and this is, uh, so in this instance, Right in the XML, you see here, your text view is called text view underscore right, text underscore view underscore ID. So the final text view, which is declared here, sets it to that. So that you can, you know, whatever happens in the main activity happens to over here in the layout. So if I want to set text to that, I wouldn't use this, I would use this. So in your UI, it would change it to, you know, user greeting or something like that. Next most important thing is the button. So this is a user interface that allows you to, you know, tap or click or for an action. So this is what it looks like in the XML. And this is what it looks like in the activity, right? 
Now the most important method for the button to set on click listener, right? So whenever you click your button, it needs to do something, right? So I'll click on click view V and you know, over here you can do whatever you want, right? So say you want to set your button to say hello, right? You could, you could do V dot set text quote hello. And that would you know change what the button says to hello. Next, uh, next thing is image view, which is just an image on the screen. So an image view displays image resources such as bitmaps or drawable resources. It also used, it's also used to apply you know tints to an image and handle image scaling. The only important thing you need to know now is just you know having an image appear on your screen. So following is an example of the XML layout. So it looks like this, right? So wrap content, wrap content. It just so have a have a bigger images, right? If it's 200 pixels across, 200 pixels high, on your screen it will appear as that. Uh, to display a specific PNG or JPEG image, so you have to download it on your computer and then just drag it and drop, drag and drop it into your res folder. So it, it's literally called the res, which is short resource file. And uh, to declare the image view in your activity class, set the, your field equal to find view by rd r dot id dot drawable. And so drawable would be like the name of the JPEG or PNG. So an example would be like, so you downloaded banana.jpg. So it would be image view one equals find view by ID R dot ID banana. Yeah. Next thing is fragments. So it's like a module modular portion of the UI with an activity. Uh, going deeper into this, what exactly is an activity? So, I mean, what is it exactly is a fragment? So a fragment represents a reusable portion of your app's UI. So a fragment, you know, defines and manages its own layout, has its own life cycle, and can handle its own input events. Input events, so like tapping on the screen or scrolling up or down. So a fragment cannot live on its own like an activity. They must be hosted by an activity or another fragment. And the fragment's view hierarchy becomes part of, of or attached to the host hierarchy. Now the benefits of, benefits of a fragment. All right, so you might be thinking, why don't I just put all of my stuff in the activity instead of doing a fragment and the base activity? So the fragment basically introduces modularity and reusability into your activities UI by allowing you to divide the UI into discrete uh, chunks. So with the example I had before with the Rage Shadow Legends, so say you were on a quest, right? Um, in your main activity, right? You could have like, basic information like 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 points or whatever or like coins you have right and on the top you could have different quests or whatever you're currently playing right so the 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 coins or the points whatever stays the same so it's always there but the quest always changes right so as an fragment would it be important it would be important to you know it would be it's basically super important to you know allow you to use the same activity but do different quests so activities are a great place to put global events around your apps ui such as a navigation drawer, which basically just like as it suggests, like a, you know, when you're on a, like a website, right? There's like a table of where you want to go. That's an example of that. So fragments are better suited to define and manage the UI of a single screen or a portion of the screen because it's specialized, right? Which is why it's better. And in apps that change screen managing, the change of the navigation drawer and say a grid layout can be unwieldy. So say if you change the layered screen to make it horizontal right the the points and the coins and like the quests might become like jumbled up right so if you split into global uh, global elements and a fragment then that can make the process much easier so over here is an example so yes yeah, so this would be an example if your phone was constrained if, if your phone was like horizontal and if it was vertical right so this is this is part of the main activity this is part of the files, the fragment, right? So say if you if they were together, right? You would have to deal with turning this into this and turning this into this, which is a lot of work, right? So just separate it, which is you know much easier. Um, now we're gonna go for an example of creating a fragment. So go to the layout in your rest folder and add a fragment, right? Click and scroll down. So it basically just has it there, right? It has uh, menus, scroll views, not menus and other things, fragments, I can't remember now, but fragments is the most important one. So you can add views to your fragments. So this is much like a like an XML. 
So like you can add text views, image views, or buttons. And creating a layout will also create a corresponding Java file. Right? So this is where you, this is where you deal with whatever happens to your layout uh, fragment. So button presses or text views or being typed into and stuff like that. So you have to declare a view in your field class. And this, this is in uh, this this is in the main it's the parent activity you need to do this. So you have to set the field set uh, the field to rec the return class of the inflate method and return it. Basically, just looks like this, right? Um, so on your on create is here. So this is basically just like a, like a view, whatever it's showing you, the fragment, right? And you just to implement this method and whatever method you're calling current, whatever fragment you're calling, right? Um, also for this, Android.name specific um, specifies the class name of the fragment to instantiate. So when the activity layout is inflated, specified fragment is in, uh, in, uh, initiated, instantiated. So like this here is what's shown. And on, on inflated is called on the newly instantiated fragment, which adds a, and you can, you can add a fragment transaction when it's created. So an example would be this, but you don't, you don't really need to know this, just, just this part here, which is like creating a fragment. Uh, another important thing is multi-threading, multi-threading, which is running multiple threads on the same machine. So usually, um, like my machine, right? It's CPU is like a, I don't know, like a hexacore, which is like six cores, so I can run like twelve threads, which are just like this, you know, unit processes. Well, I'll explain it in more detail, basically. So a thread is a simple unit of process, or literally a group of code to be executed. So in the CPU, each thread is allocated memory and instructions to allow it to run. So what are the benefits of multi-threading? So multi-threading allows for increased thought put and computational speed up, uh, which is essentially more data going in and it's computed on faster, but it doesn't change the output. So you won't be getting more stuff done um, within a single you know, process. So instead of doing all the work on one thread, you can do it on two to get the process. Um, so why might it be necessary to have a separate thread from the main one in Android Studio? Uh, on Android, the single thread that handles all updates to the UI is the main thread. It's also called the UI thread. Um, it handles all on-click listeners for the UI, for the UI and lifecycle callback. So on create, on return, on stop and on click for like a button, right? So the UI is the default thread for everything for your app. Uh, so everything on your app usually runs on there and it updates uh, every 16 milliseconds, which is, you know, quite fast. So if something takes a bit longer than that, then your, you know, your app might crash because it's not updating fast enough. Uh, now, sometimes common tasks such as fetching data from the internet or reading a large file of writing data in a database takes longer than 60 milliseconds. So therefore performing those actions might freeze your app or cause the pause header or even freeze. So an example is this. Uh, the app may even crash and present an application not responding in our dialogue. Uh, Multi-threading is also thread, uh, thread safe. I mean, multi-threading we're gonna go thread safe. So the Android view objects are not thread safe. So I'll go into more detail about that. So if you try to reference them inside of a thread other than the main UI thread, the result can be exceptions, sonic failures, crashes, and other undefined misbehaviors. So an example of this is say you have one new UI thread, right? Another thread that gets data. Say that get data, you know, it causes it calls like a button, right? Now that would be a problem because you know, buns are only specifically called the UI thread, and that would cause your app to crash. Uh, so the, there are two UI object references, which are basically like, you know, reasons why, you know, that would fail because of it not being thread safe. So explicit references are when a thread directly ca calls upon a view object. For example, it, it might say a set text a, which, it, you know, it can't do, it only get data. It can't change what, you know, happens to a view. Now, so now say the activity in view A is destroyed, then the activity can only be recycled upon once the worker thread references it completely. 
So in the UI thread, right, activity A is gone, it's destroyed. But it won't appear that way because the you know the, the other thread is still using it, and this might cause your app to crash. Uh, implicit references occur when threading objects are declared in another activity as a non-static inner class. So the benefits of declaring it as a static class are that the inner class can be instantiated without instantiating its outer class, right? So meaning that it will not refer reference the activity and cause delays. Also, a static inner class can access all static members of its outer class, which reduces the risk of the NR. So basically, it just looks uh, like this. Um, one second. I hit we're in the same one. So now we're going to persisting threads and thread priority. So threads usually persist past the lifetime of the, the activities that spawn them. So say on a story is call called, then you know activity, then a thread might be going past that, which is a big problem because your app might crash. So they continue to execute uninterrupted, uninterrupted regardless of the creature instruction activities. And sometimes it's desirable. So if the user destroys an activity, the thread will keep on running and it will maybe like say download an image, right? Or in the, caching it onto the, the data, right? And whenever the user restarts that activity, the image will be there. So that, that and that is it be desirable, but usually it's not. So it's important to assign the right priorities to the right threads at the right times. So if you say the priority is too high, such so as you know, thread priority default versus third priority background, your uh, default is what runs first, background runs later. So if they were all default, that might cause some problems because your app might interrupt the UI thread and the render thread, causing the app to drop things, which means it, it just lags, which is another big problem. And if you set it too low, then it can cause it, you know, the async has to be low, slower than it needs to be. So the threads will complete slower than it needs to be, and it, it'll be, it will be more effective. Um, whenever you create a thread, you should call the set thread priority. Methods of the system, Casual knows which order to run threads. So it'll do it for you because um, that's how the Google, you know, whoever created it, just created it. Uh, um, next thing is thread priorities and helper classes. So using the process class, you can input values such as set thread priority with the thread priority default, thread priority less favorable, et cetera. And it goes on and on, you know, from most desirable to less least desirable. And here are the lists. So, um, Next, moving on to that, so what are helper, cl helper classes? So simply put, helper classes are, uh, as well as the job class and other primitives, uh, that help facilitate threading. So the thread, runnable executors. So the most uh, important helper uh, helper class is the handler thread class. So a handler thread is effectively a long running thread that grabs work from a queue and operates on it. So it, it considers getting previews from your camera object. When you're interested for the frames, you receive them on preview frame. So the UI uh, thread might crash having to deal with the huge pixel arrays. So it might be too much data for the UI. In this case, you can run the camera open command on your handler thread, such that the on preview frame callback to run there, which allows the UI to be safe from potentially crashing. Um, when your app creates a thread using the handler thread, make sure to set the priorities so that it knows what to do first, what to do later. And also because the UI can only handle a small number of threads in parallel. So if you have four cores, you can only handle eight threads usually. So an example would be this. And so this is basically where it looks like in the activity class. Uh, next uh, important helper class is the thread pool executor class. So sometimes work can be reduced to highly parallel distributed tasks, for example, tackling a filter uh, an eight megapixel image. So the sheer amount of work might be too much for the handler thread to be a, to be appropriate. So the thread pool executor manages the, uh, the creation of a group of threads, uh, setting the priorities and managing how work is distributed among those threads. So as workload increases or decreases, that will be either added or destroyed. And the class will set an awesome number of threads as the app will set a maximum and a minimum number of threads. So an example would be this. Um, moving on, here's some more basic threading examples. Um, also, I will post this on the High School Navigator blog, 
So if you guys want to go over it, then you can do that. But I'm um, kind of running out of time, so I'll just speed it up right now. So API, which is an application programming interface. So API are just, are just like user interfaces in that software. Applications interact with them in the same way that we would interact with apps. So an example of this might be an API returning the weather or description of a certain food in the database. So what are the benefits of an API? I think that think of the principles of an API like an electrical socket. So the user wants the electricity, but without the socket, you know, which is the standard, the user would not be able to get it. So an API can get you the electricity, so to speak, but you know, you will be the one that's converting it. So usually APIs return JSON files and you'll have to convert that into something that the something that the, the activity can read. Some benefits might be like you might be able to create a database and get information from an API call, right? Uh, moving on. Uh, Firebase, which is a mobile platform that helps you to develop high quality apps. So Firebase is uh, Google's mobile platform that helps you quickly develop high quality apps, as I said, but I'll go into like more detail with what the products they provide. So in essence, it provides products that make building apps much easier to the databases and train machine learning models. So what products they provide a real-time database. So basically what this is, is um, you put it to database, right? So say you have like an app that gathers information of users when they log in, right? And you want to save the information, you can send to the database at Firebase and the data like, you know, their emails or their passwords and their names will be saved there. Next thing is Firebase ML, which stands for machine learning. So say you want to create a, like a certain machine learning process, right? So you can input images into that and the machine learning thing that they've created will learn it. So it'll learn what like what's a line, what's a lemon, something like that. If you input images, right? Cloud messaging uh, authentication, which is just like if you're logging in in like a certain app, then it will do that. It'll do that for you. And cloud storage, which is, which is basically what it sounds, sourcing in the cloud. So here's a link to that, and you can look at it when I post it on my home navigator. Debugging, which is fixing your errors. Um, so Android Studio provides a built-in debugger to help you catch errors and fix them. So at the bottom of the screen, which is the log cat, uh, if you change the, the drop-down menu option from verbose, verbose to error, the uh, error will usually show up in red. And otherwise, going to verbose, verbose can tell you the app when the app's processes are stopped or log statements. So usually what happens with me is um, I have some errors in my log cat, and I go and see what's in the red. And then I copy paste, put it in my browser, and I go on Stack Overflow and I figure out what's wrong. Um, fortunately, we can't do a live demo, but um, if you guys email me at android at I will send you a video of me doing this app and creating it. Um, moving on, other useful info. So this is basically like the links that I got my information from, and it's just the, the, the Android developer you know, website, which explains everything. Obviously, it's a bit complicated, but you can just go on YouTube and figure it out too. Uh, basically, um, thank you for coming to my presentation. I know it was a bit rushed because uh, we didn't have enough time, but um, if you have any questions, you can ask, you can send it to the, this, this this email, or you can go to my our website. And uh, here, I, we've also added our Facebooks, Instagram, and LinkedIn and Instagram. So. I will post this on High School Navigator's blog, and you guys can look at it later. Um, uh, when will this be, this be posted? Um, probably like tomorrow or something like that. Uh, I don't really have a time frame, but I will I will post it, and uh, and I will make sure that um, if you guys have any questions, you can ask me because I am passionate about teaching kids. Um, also, so basically, this is over now. You guys can stop if you want to. Um, bye everybody. Also, uh, thanks for coming to our presentation. Bye.